We thought we would start by just having our panelists uh, talk about themselves for uh, briefly. Bill already introduced um, them, but also about their institution. Um, tell us um, work about your institution. We, when we were having our planning call, we discussed how every uh, every institution is different, has different challenges. So we thought it might be helpful for y'all to understand. Uh, what their institution looks like before we start talking about the challenges and successes that we've had. So we'll start with Mel. Okay. Our hospitals are in four communities, Swainsboro, Metter, Fitzgerald, and Osceola, uh, populations of 15,000 to 25,000. Three of those hospitals are PPS hospitals. One is the critical access hospital. Uh, we, all of them are county hospitals with health authority boards. Uh, we employ most of the primary care physicians in our community, so uh, uh, managing medical practice is a big part of what we do. Uh, we have created a shared services organization, as Bill mentioned, uh, where these hospitals don't need to stand alone, uh, stand alone hospitals, but they've got the support of uh, a whole array of uh, support services from HR, IT, business office, and so forth and so on. And that's been uh, helpful in terms of saving costs and uh, improving service and moving toward best practice. Uh, our management company, ERH, uh, brings expertise in uh, healthcare law. We have a healthcare attorney on our staff, uh, finance, uh, CEO experience, uh, medical practice management, and then just experience in running nursing homes, uh, home health agencies, uh, hospice, and, and so forth. And so our model is to bring that expertise to rally around these local teams to uh, help uh, the teams and the uh, hospitals be successful to serve their communities. Good morning. I'm Tammy Mims. I'm the current CEO at Jeff Davis Hospital, as Bill said. Um, I will tell you, if you're looking for a promotion, let Bill introduce you, because last year I was COO at Effingham, and he introduced me as the CEO, and actually when I got back, I had the opportunity to become a CEO, so <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so um, I kind of grew up at uh, Memorial in Savannah and was there for about 30 years, so I got a lot of my um, experience and growing up from Memorial in Savannah, then went to Effingham and uh, fell in love with rural health care. And most recently, I've been at Jeff Davis since June of last year. So I've been there about 10 months. And uh, Jeff Davis is in Hazelhurst, Georgia. It's right in the middle between uh, Coffee County and uh, with um, uh, Douglas. And then on the other side is um, Vidalia. We're about a little less than 15,000 population. My husband's family's from Jeff Davis because some people are like, how'd you get there? Um, so um, we have a family there and have um, been um, very acquainted with that county. And um, whenever Bill mentioned 20 days cash on hand, I know some of us thought, well, wow, how nice is that? When, <laughs> when I got there, um, Jeff Davis had two days cash on hand. And so... Uh, a very uh, different picture than uh, what I was used to, but um, um, the um, group has um, really delved in and dug deep, and we've created um, some good plans and made a good turnaround within a short period of time, and we'll talk about some of those successes, but um, we're critical access. We're, we're kind of unique because of um, we have no county subsidy. We receive splosh, but it's very uh, limited, and it's uh, only used for um, uh, capital equipment. And um, we are a hospital authority, but we are not um, managed or uh, voted on by our county commissioners. They have a seat on our board, but don't vote. And it's just a different structure than what most hospital authorities um, are. So I always say, if you've seen one critical access hospital, You've seen one critical access hospital. Orthopedic doctor in Savannah, and uh, our story started out about ten years ago when the county commissioners in Reedsville came to us with a hospital that was financially strapped and fixing to declare bankruptcy, and we bought the hospital uh, in uh, February of 2008. I'm from South Georgia, uh, grew up in Darien, went to school in Brunswick, so I basically came home, and we've been in rural Georgia 
since I started practicing back in 1989. But uh, we had a kind of a different approach. We're for profit and uh, we changed the hospital, which is a critical access hospital, to a for-profit hospital and uh, felt like that uh, the rural community and, and the rural doctors could compete with the urban doctors and um, we proved this to be successful. We uh, currently have three critical access hospitals. Um, only the one in Reesville was grandfathered in prior to the Affordable Care Act, but um, we have one of the lowest complications and uh, morbidity and mortality rates. We've been uh, health grades uh, five star for the last five years in both total joints, total knees, and uh, our complication rate is one tenth of what it is in the metropolitan areas. And uh, so we see uh, the rural, rural market as a great market. In addition to the orthopedic and neurosurgery, we have established an outline clinic. We have five rural health care clinics and uh, uh, part of our mission is to make sure that in our communities that we're partners with the community. So we provide primary care services, general surgery services, as well as the orthopedic and neurosurgery, which really drive the financial success of the hospital. So we're located in Rome, Floyd County, Northwest Georgia. And Floyd Medical Center uh, has about $420 million in revenues and we serve a multi-county region of close to 400,000 folks. And immediately to the south of us is Polk County, and they have a critical access hospital that uh, for 15 years prior uh, to 2012 had a relationship uh, with our competitor. And the competitor kept the doors open but really didn't make any improvements. And the hospital authority down in Polk County decided we want something more and I have to credit them, they went out and they hired expert help, they hired Stroudwater and Associates, and they said, what can we do? What can we do to improve our hospital? It's an old Hilburton hospital. Uh, we've got a busy emergency room. Uh, we'd really like a better facility. We'd like better services. And Stroudwater advised them to, well, put yourself out for bid. We bet that there will be organizations that would be interested. And I got one of those. Uh, came to my desk in January of, of 2012, and we took, uh, I'm sorry, 2011, and we took a really hard look at that, and uh, we decided that we were going to put together a very aggressive proposal. And uh, we did. And if there is uh, transferable knowledge in, in our relationship uh, with the uh, Cedartown Polk County Hospital Authority and us, I think it is that they were very. Uh, eager and in search of uh, a goal, which was to build a new hospital and improve their services. And then we were both very creative in our responses. They are critical access hospitals, so they therefore have uh, critical access hospital reimbursement. Uh, they're about 25 miles for us, so you know I immediately knew, just bit based upon my knowledge of uh, reimbursement, uh, that we could enter into a relationship where we could establish a home office cost report. And the establishment of a home office cost report enables you to share overhead. So there would be a financial benefit uh, to us as a host hospital in sharing overhead. So I knew that would be a foundation in the financial uh, stability of the organization. They also had good volume as well. They had uh, over 20,000 emergency visits, uh, which is unusual for a critical access hospital, with 42,000 folks that live in Polk County. And so they are really underserved in primary care. A lot of folks go to the emergency room, over 20,000 ED visits. And they had uh, basically one to two inpatients a day and then a few swing bed patients. And so we saw there's not only the opportunity for critical access reimbursement, the home office cost report, but also volume, which is important. And if you don't have volume, the sharing overhead isn't much good. And so there, there is some volume on, on which to spread that overhead. So we put together a very aggressive proposal, uh, and we won. Uh, key to our proposal, in fact, key to the RFP from uh, the Cedartown Polk County Hospital Authority was that they wanted a new hospital. And we responded to that. We built them a new hospital. They wanted OR capability, and they also wanted a new medical office building. Uh, we modeled all of that out, and uh, I felt very clearly that we could do it and be successful. And not only have we been successful, we have uh, exceeded all of our expectations. 
uh, we also uh, put together uh, in our assessment, uh, we extended our emergency room physician group down to that hospital. Uh, just quite frankly there, they didn't have a lot of money in order to buy the best of the best, if you will, in order to, to bring in emergency room physicians. So by bringing our emergency room physician to that facility, patients recognize better quality. They just do. And so our ED volumes have risen at Polk Medical Center. Uh, they were in the low 20s, now they're in the high 20s. So since in the five years we've been uh, in our lease arrangement, we've even increased our ED volume. Uh, we have a very robust orthopedic program and we put together a swing bed program. Uh, we call it a subacute program for those frail orthopedic patients that don't qualify to, to go home on outpatient PT or to go to a comprehensive inpatient rehab program. They may need to go into a nursing home type setting and so we established that at Polk Medical Center and it is just going gangbusters. Uh, it's in a brand new facility so who doesn't want to go a brand new facility with highly qualified PTs and OTs and everybody else and so it's worked really really well and the Polk Medical Center has uh, high margins uh, in the 20 percent range and the uh, one of the things that enabled us to win the relationship with Polk Medical Center is that being a nonprofit uh, and being part of our primary service area uh, I proposed to my board it took them a minute everybody should uh, scratch their heads I said you know Let's let all the benefit of profitability accrue to Polk County and Polk Medical Center. They have the same mission we do, uh, so let's, let's let their bank account grow as their programs evolve, and let's even give them the benefit of our cost report allocations, uh, which we did. And so their day's cash on hand are growing uh, to benefit the citizens of that community. Now, I don't know how much this might be a model for other areas of Georgia, but if there are critical access hospitals with volume, that is a value to the facilities to whom you refer. Thank you all. By the way, I love this new microphone. It makes me feel like Bob Barker, Price is Right. Yeah. It's awesome. Um, well, living in Atlanta today, the biggest challenge is traffic. But as uh, rural hospital executives, uh, y'all face your own challenges in your respective institutions. So I thought uh, you already mentioned some, but maybe start with Kurt and now work backwards. I know it changes all the time, so maybe in the last six, nine, 12 months, talk about one of the biggest challenges that you have faced, and then even it out, though, if you can, with um, something that you're proud of, a, a success that you've, uh, that you've accomplished. Well, I just stated that we're, we're successful financially. So now the challenge is, and we are rising to the challenge, what do we do with the money? And the hospital authority down in Polk County uh, is going through a strategic planning process as to what is the most responsible way to use our growing bank account. Uh, and part of that is, gee, will the critical access reimbursement uh, last forever? So perhaps we ought to grow a balance such that we can have ongoing uh, non-operating revenue. So that's, that's one thing that's being attacked or addressed in our strategic plan. But the second thing, and perhaps it's more important, is what are the key health care needs that are unmet in our community? Let's identify those, see what things that we can do and what we can do in partnership with others. So but that's really our, our key now in Polk County is we've got our hospital stabilized, we're delivering great care, now what are some of the unmet needs that we can and should identify and partner to address? Before you move to Dr. Woods, raise your hand if your problem, your institution is what do we do with all this money? Okay. <laughs> Dr. Woods. The, uh, our, our critical access hospital, I think one of our biggest challenges going forward is going to be to how to uh, deal with narrow networks. Uh, that, that's something that we're very concerned about. And, with the current team and his critical access with Floyd Medical Center, that's a strategic advantage for his little hospital, and that it would be really hard to cut them out. But for us, we're already seeing that uh, in uh, the, the larger hospital systems that um, th they want to lend a helping hand uh, to the smaller hospitals, but that helping hand doesn't need to be too helping. So um, our concern is that they would like to see us go away. Uh, they really would like to see us as a referral source versus a standalone 
And we're already seeing that in the uh, Savannah market where the healthcare products they're trying to bring out are healthcare products that are, it doesn't matter what the costs are, they have to be done in the larger institution, even if we can do them better and cheaper and, and uh, with less complications. So, you know, that's a really, really big concern, I think, for all of us in, in the rural healthcare is how do we negotiate? And um, it's interesting that you're a U.S. attorney. One of our problems is that we can't negotiate together. The, uh, so we're having to negotiate uh, standalone. And you can't have a standalone 25-bed hospital negotiating against a 500-bed hospital. The insurance companies just don't care. So it, for us, and Tammy would echo the same thing, we can't afford to go out and network with the Blues or United. We'll go broke. So those are our challenges. I think our successes have been that we have shown that even in a small community, and again, you know, I'm from a small community. I've grown up my whole life, and uh, we've dedicated our practice to serving those needs, that we can do things just as good or better in our hospital system with physician leadership as it can be done in the larger systems. Biggest challenge, especially when I first went in, when you have two days cash on hand and you're watching every single penny, nickel, dime being spent and um, watching every single thing that comes in, of course, was uh, our financial situation. And so um, one thing that we uh, sat down and instead of doing a quick turnaround and just cutting and slashing, we really dug deep and created a, a five-year um, sustainability plan that um, I had spent probably several weeks just talking to the community, um, just popping in at different meetings, going to Rotary, going to the chamber, talking to the county commissioners. Um, you know, you go get your nails done. Everybody talks about the hospital, so you just, you know, take your name badge off and just go in and <laughs> secret shop. So really, the, um, the support was there, but you had to then ask, how does an organization for years continually continually lose over $1.7 million year after year, what's going on. So when we did kind of a forensic uh, review, um, a lot of it was you have uh, one provider that's 80% of your business get mad. So when you have one provider that's 80% of your business get mad and your average daily census is one, that's a problem. So I went and, and met with the individual and um, tried to figure out what happened and what we could do together. And um, we were very successful in being able to create a good relationship and bringing that individual back. But also talking to the other independent physicians because depending on one physician is not uh, very uh, dependable <laughs> because he could you know, decide next week he's mad again. So, so I think, um, but working on our five-year uh, sustainability, and I told everybody, we're not doing this for six months to look good. We're doing this for the future, that if the community has said, we want a hospital, then um, I, I did our team member meetings and said, we have to support ourselves. And so we immediately said, quit going to all other hospitals. You know, Baxley's 13 miles down the street. Our own employees were going and having their mammogram there. Well, we do mammogram. Why are you not supporting ourselves? And no one really had ever shared with the team members. They didn't really see it as that. They just, they have always gone to here, there, or yonder, and they didn't see taking those own services that we could provide um, to be not helpful. And so I think um, having the team member meetings and getting people engaged and uh, letting them really see the vision long term, not we're doing this for six months and then when the dust settles, we'll see what's left. I think uh, really rallied everyone to say, you know, we've got to dig in and, and we all have to uh, make this work and make it be sustainable. So our sustainability plan was really um, cost containment. We hit all low-hanging fruit, and that was the first um, opportunity of just all unnecessary cost. And then we looked at revenue cycle, where you look at your charge master, but look at upfront collections and implementing things that, um, you know, a lot of rural hospitals like to say, well, we're small. It, it doesn't matter if you're 25 beds or 600 beds. 
everyone has upfront collections. You don't see anybody without upfront collections now. So um, part of that was to quit acting uh, that small then limits you. It does not, just like um, Dr. George says, I've worked in a large organization and a small. Um, at a large organization, you have to get 40 people in a room to try to make a decision, right? Where you come to a rural hospital, you put three people in a room and say, what do we need to do? And I've been able to see much faster change and better outcomes because you're so much closer to it um, to be able to achieve um, better financial um, turnarounds, um, hopefully the sustainability um, that's needed, but also better um, patient satisfaction and uh, better outcomes. And I think, um, you know, the comment that Dr. Burke made about the, the outcomes, I truly believe if, if, if rural health has time to adjust to the health care changes of the future, that better um, outcomes for those communities will come. Because we're looking at a collaborative with, um, I know Vicki Lewis is here, and she's the CEO over at Douglas. And when I first came in, I had lunch with most surrounding um, CEOs. But I really connected with Vicki because she has a like mindset. We don't deliver babies in Jeff Davis, but part of our issues is a high mortality for no prenatal care for our moms, and the babies are high risk. And so I've asked Vicki to say, help us with that. How do we get this community to get their prenatal um, visits? So she's talked to several of her physicians. Her physicians are going to come to Jeff Davis. They're going to lease space um, and start seeing patients. We're going to have to get a, a vehicle to go pick people up for this. But that's what you have to do because there is no transportation. So people don't get any prenatal care. They come to RER. They're at a high risk of labor. We don't deliver babies here, so we try to <laughs> calm it down as much as possible and then ship them. Well, the person that shift is high risk, and so is the baby. That's costing t the overall healthcare system tons and tons of money. So we're chipping away at each of those product lines to say, okay, what's next? What's next? So if we can get our arms around the financial hurdles, we can get assistance from some of the regulatory um, um, components that we have against us. Then part of it is time to be able to implement some of these programs to really have a healthier community. And um, I think that's, hopefully, that's everyone's goal. <laughs> you know, count the volume of value referrals. Okay. That is very true. You have my information. Uh, Mel? All right. In terms of challenges, I think the overarching challenge for us is just the harsh economic environment of rural Georgia, uh, the high poverty levels, the... Uh, uh, the high deductible plans and the individuals that aren't able to pay on those high deductible plans, the uh, high un uncompensated care, no Medicaid expansion. Uh, the rural environment is, uh, it feels like a third world country in, in, uh, compared to the metro areas of, uh, of Atlanta and uh, the other metro areas. So I live up here and then I go to these rural hospitals and it's, uh, it's just a, uh, a stark contrast. And so the economic environment is probably the biggest. Um, I think structurally, the fact that uh, Georgia has all these small ho uh, counties with small hospitals associated with them without the population base to really s support the small hospitals makes it very, very difficult. And uh, so these ho hospitals struggle to uh, survive as standalone hospitals, but in some way, structurally, it needs to be reorganized and restructured where we have more of a collaborative uh, mindset like uh, Kurt and uh, 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 Dr. King, uh, Canto and others and Vicki that will work with smaller hospitals and work with that concept that care should be closest to home and to try to support that as opposed to having the mindset that uh, we'd just assume they go away. And, uh, and we know the business will just come to us if they go away. A lot of the larger uh, hospitals uh, have the latter mindset as opposed to the collaborative uh, mindset. And so 
that's a challenge. Another challenge is just the uh, uh, these small counties have uh, county commissions that have pretty provincial thinking. And so they're not real open, you know, to collaborating with the next county because that's the football team that we compete against, you know. And so, uh, so there's got to be, uh, I think, a whole change in mindset uh, from the local county level as well. Uh, another big challenge we have is just attracting talent, and uh, not only the clinical talent but, and the providers, but uh, leadership talent and, and just having the resources to have the talent. So those are some of the big challenges. I wrote down uh, in terms of you know, our formula for success, it's pretty much, as you mentioned, it's a, it's a long-term model. Uh, so we come in with, with a five-year plan, and uh, then we act decisively with a, an array of interventions. Uh, we first do what we can to uh, secure the, the physician base. And uh, so that, that's led us to employing most of the primary care physicians, and then once we uh, uh, secure the primary care base, then we attract selected uh, uh, specialists and we manage those practices uh, effectively and we try to build our, uh, our physician base in the community. Uh, we reduce costs and we do that primarily through this shared services model uh, where we can share expertise across uh, multiple hospitals where they can't afford to have their you know, own IT department, own HR department, uh, own business office, and so forth. We spread those uh, costs across uh, multiple hospitals. Uh, we work the revenue cycle. Most of these had terrible managed care contracts. So we would evaluate the managed care contracts, and then we would go to these large insurers and try to uh, renegotiate that. Uh, and then from there, work with uh, billing and collections and really uh, try to enhance the revenue process. Uh, we have added new services, and so we've looked at niche services, uh, whether it's the geriatric psych or uh, swing bed services or uh, uh, specializing in OBGYN or telemedicine or whatever it is. You know, we've tried to bring in new services. And uh, we have been focused on uh, best practice, whether that's uh, customer service best practice to really improve the patient experience or management best practices in terms of the uh, practices and uh, uh, processes of management, uh, you know, creating uh, performance metric systems so that there's some accountability as well as employee engagement. And uh, then we've improved clinical quality in terms of our uh, outcomes. And uh, a big part of this through the whole process has just been connecting with the community. So, uh, so we feel like we've got uh, a fine product in each of these cases because when you look at the comparative results in terms of patient satisfaction, clinical outcomes, employee satisfaction, uh, we score very high. Uh, it's just hard to, uh, with all these other factors, to have a vibrant hospital because the challenges are so great. So now that we've got all that out of the way, let's talk politics. Why not? You know, it's Friday mm -hmm. in Athens. Um, I know we have, uh, well, there'll be a little bit of overlap. Um, I heard on uh, the radio or whatever, day or two ago, that in Washington they're still talking about the Affordable Care Act um, repeal and replace. And, um, of course, part of the Affordable Care Act intertwined with that is Medicaid expansion or lack thereof. So I know we have some current and former legislatures, legislators in the room today. So um, why don't we just start, any of you could start, uh, give um, your thoughts on, on that and um, maybe what your, um, how it's affected you down in your institution and what you're hoping for for the future. Dr. George, you seem like you, you probably have a thought or two and all that. <laughs> have a thought or two. Uh, you know, the, the Medicaid expansion, the, we kind of knew that was going to be a, a topic of discussion. And it's just a difficult, can you hear me? 
I think it's just uh, uh, it's it's difficult from the hospital's financial point of view. You know, any patient that has any kind of resource or reimbursement is better than the ones that don't. And and when we took over our hospitals, they were pretty much all the critical access hospitals are 75 to 80 percent Medicare, Medicaid, and 10 percent commercial, and the other 10 percent uninsured. So the um and, and all of them were basically losing about fifty thousand dollars a month to a hundred thousand dollars a month. So you know, increase in and in in any kind of reimbursement, and we're cost-based reimbursement. So for us, uh, a Medicaid patient helps us on the cost report, and if we do something on them, it's better than doing something on a patient that has nothing. From the state's perspective, the question is going to be is whether we're going to be hung. Uh, if the federal government decides down the road to cut back the 90% uh, matching funds. So I, th I think that uh, that's just, uh, uh, it, it's tough. There's two sides of that equation from a, from a health care provider. We would uh, uh, like to see it expanded from a, uh, uh, from a conservative in terms of the, the state budget. I, I think that, uh, I think that's just a tough call. But the other thing that uh, I want to comment on is the Affordable Care Act, because I do think that for hospitals, especially small hospitals, to be successful, I think they have to collaborate with their doctors. And um, I think that is, that is the model. And when I mean collaboration with their doctors, I think that doctors have to have skin in the game. Uh, I think they have to be at risk. And, you know, some of these health care uh, models uh, the, uh, the the presenting do have risk sharing, but uh, the, the the risk sharing when we've looked at them in terms of our, our practice, there was a lot of risk and not a lot of sharing, and it's something that we just uh, are, are not going to participate in. But I do believe that uh, I, I do believe you have to have physician involvement, uh, maybe physician ownership. And if they repeal the Affordable Care Act, that's one of the provisions that I'd like to see go away because I think that that was put in at the benefit of the hospital association and I think physician uh, collaboration and ownership and risk is very important going forward to have the healthcare models that we want to contain costs and, and have better outcomes and uh, you do that and pay more attention to that when you have uh, skin in the game. 1030 to 1045 Bill. Okay. Yeah, sure. T tell me, you just you want to say some words? About just going to say, I mean, most recently with um, our current situation is, you know, with the overall health care high deductible plans, we've seen um, a lot of um, our bad bad debt being increased, and so um, that's probably you know for um, everyone. But like Dr. George said. You know, us being with our current structure, and I know a lot of people talk, okay, we're going from volume to value. Well, okay, but that's not how we're paid today. So, um, you know, you kind of get in that straddle of, I see that on the horizon, but I know where we're at today. And so, you know, I tell everybody, it's like the Titanic. You're driving this ship, and you're going to try to not hit that iceberg so hard and, and sink. You're just going to try to scrape by it. But... You know, you have to start preparing for the future, but you can't turn too fast because you won't you won't be able to survive until you get to that point. So, you know, we're we're having to manage the increase in, in bad debt, but also be real creative with, um, you know, um, upfront collections and being able to get more cash to the bottom line, and to be able to do, um, you know, some pricing with um, the payers that. Uh, can pay, but if someone has a ten thousand dollar deductible, you know we've got a lot of farmers. They come in there, they have bags, you know, and uh, you know some wanted to bring chickens, and you know we we did have that at one of our doctor's offices. Um, they went. Uh, well, he was actually thankful because he liked the fresh eggs. But anyway, um, you know we we um, you know we. That's not going to change. I think even with the regulatory stuff, the high deductibles, you know, ask most people here, you know, most people have a, a high deductible, um, you know, on their um, health plans. And so I think that, um, you know, our, our opportunity is how are we going to manage uh, within that and 
I think, you know, rural health um, hospitals and providers are going to have to realize we can't be everything to everyone. So pick, just like Mel said, they've picked their niches. You know, we, um, as we came up with, okay, get, getting our finances more in order, then we looked at, you know, the revenue and cost savings. Now we've got to grow. And so, you know, you can't remain as a one or two average daily census. And so, you know, we're, we're fortunate, um, you know, to have 1821 in a 25 bed hospital um, with swing bed programs. And, but don't develop programs just to be develop them. Look at all of your out migration. If, um, and I think yesterday we were uh, with a group of people, if 80% of the rural health business that's there, even if it's the, you know, 70 to 80% Medicare, Medicaid, if 80% of that business stayed in that county for the services that that rural hospital could perform, a lot of them would not be in the predicament that they're in. And so how do you do that? You can be an older hospital. We were built in 1963, and I have people come through there every day saying, wow, these floors sure are clean. No one says, this is an old building. And so people, people's perception of quality is on the cleanliness, and we, you know, people, uh, we, we know um, some of those things, just like the bigger organizations. Our hospitals are probably cleaner than some of the bigger organizations um, because we spend well, more time with that. <laughs> um, last uh, quick topic, and as I was looking down about to ask this question, I realized the little notepad I had was still from my time at the U.S. Attorney's Office, which uh, from in the Southern District, Georgia. But um, everyone's favorite topic, we talked a little on our planning call, the Stark Law anti-kickback statute, these overbearing government regulations that don't allow healthcare to, uh, to expand like other industries. Uh, rural hospitals have a very big issue with attracting quality healthcare providers. Uh, one of y'all already mentioned it. And the, um, the regulations uh, do not help that. So anyone have any thoughts on um, what maybe the federal government can do to loosen some of those regulations um, to help rural health care uh, providers attract good quality physicians to their institution? Well, I don't have specific ideas, but, but I've got to agree with Dr. George. I mean, we do need the ability to be more creative, uh, particularly in this era of shrinking resources. You just asked a question about Medicaid. Uh, nationwide, one out of five people are covered by Medicaid, and in some communities it's more than that. Uh, and it's a growing part of the federal uh, budget and you know I, I understand the question that we've got to get control of this as a nation uh, but how we do it we got to be creative and I've got faith in our creativity and then we've got uh, laws such as Stark and anti-kickback that uh, hamstring us so much we, we do need more flexibility I don't have any specific answer but we absolutely need more flexibility yeah. Thoughts on that? Uh, the um, you know I I've been the subject of an OIG investigation, and um, it, it uh, you were probably one of the attorneys. I was there, but that was Edgar. I was I was looking at Memorial. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> and, 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 and 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 Edgar now works for our law firm, so he switched sides too. The uh, so come come to me and make that change. No. <laughs> but but uh, you, you know the the and it it's nothing against the U.S. attorneys because they're kind of doing their job. But the the federal statutes, I mean, they're, they're murky. Uh, they're they're very difficult. I mean, it upended our organization uh, to the point that uh, the the quarter after we were filed, we, we didn't know whether we were going to survive. Um, from the stigma that uh, in a small town that, uh, I mean, people were calling our competitors and saying, you know, are they closing? Um, the, uh, all the allegations that uh, we were criminals and, and uh, these things. And it all had to do, you know, w with, uh, with these stark statues that, that one, of, one of our violations was that from 2008 to 2009 to have a management agreement as a physician practice with a hospital that it changed that you had to have a signed piece of paper and the terms were okay, the cost report was okay, everything was okay, but the piece of paper was not okay, which means that 
all Medicare money that we received that entire year had to be paid back. And we could be paid back times three, and if they thought we did it on purpose, it's $5,500 to $11,000 per incident. And, and, and you can't, nobody can afford that. So you, you come to the table with a burden of 30 or $40 million fine on a hospital that's revenue that, uh, you know, is, is a couple million dollars a month, and what do you do? And, and you have, there's nothing you can do. You, you just, you, you just plead guilty and say, help me. And, and, you know, I think the U.S. attorneys realize that, that uh, especially uh, in, in the, uh, some of these communities, that, uh, that, that bankrupts the community. So it's, it's been a tremendous burden, uh, uh, I think, on all of us, making sure we stay within the rules and the regs. You know, for instance, we have a, a lawyer on staff in our office, the, the, uh, and if you have an attorney that's there as a compliance attorney and you are in violation, your fine is less. I mean, the, the, um, and that's just all coming down so we, we're hoping that the, the uh, they're going to relax some of these rules there, there's been a big push to overturn start and, um, and and at least uh, let us do the things that the other industries do in terms of uh, you know collaborating with our customers and, and uh, which are the physicians and and uh, the insurance companies and the businesses and try to be innovative in, in what we do without uh, violating the law but could we wait till my daughter gets through school to overturn start? I don't know. Uh, yes, exactly. Any question? Well, we have nursing homes and we have geriatric psych uh, programs, and in both those settings, uh, dementia is uh, prevalent. And uh, so, uh, most, as you say, state most of the people that we serve are older, and uh, so we are trying to keep uh, patient-centered, and uh, they are our patients, and so we're trying to design services and have a perspective that uh, meets those needs. That's true. Uh, we started with 10 and now we're going to 15 because it, it grew so quickly. It's been, it's been, yeah, it's been helpful. And we did that with the uh, USDA loan, so we appreciate the government for that and Mark Mentos uh, for collaboration. We're on the we're on the margin, you know. So, any any major cut or any uh, that's why when you look at the uh, repeal and replace or any kind of a major cut in Medicaid or other kinds of things, it's just it's a, they are dark clouds for us uh, because we have so little margin for error. And so, unlike uh, larger hospitals that have some margin for and flexibility for adjusting to those, we have very little margin to adjust. So that's, that's the reality of what we face.
Well, and I think if you look even um, in urban, uh, but it, um, also rural, there's a, not a lot of providers now that um, will um, provide for Medicaid. I mean, there there's a big, um, um, where a lot of people just say, I'm not taking it anymore. The, the uh, physicians can't afford to, to take those patients. So I think if it um, gets um, worse, then I think that um, the emergency rooms will just fill up. And I think access to care is going to be a big, big problem. I think our emergency rooms would, would fill up because um, the lack of transportation in rural areas is an issue. Um, so that's um, why, you know, I guess the, um, you know, if you've got 40, 50,000 population, you got 20,000 ER, that's because they can get a ride. They can get a ride to an emergency room. <laughs> you can't to a primary care. So I think overall outcomes of health outcomes will um, decrease dramatically too.